In the previous module, we talked about why alternatives are important for understanding scalar implicatures, and we talked about what alternatives are. Uh, but we ended by noticing some problems with our ideas about alternatives. Um, so to go back to the example that we ended the previous module with, we noted that if I say that's a cat, then there's an infinite number of stronger alternatives I did not say. Um, so if I chose to say that's a cat, that means I didn't say that's a cat and I like ice cream. I didn't say that's a cat and I like ice cream and snails are slow. All of these are stronger alternatives that I could have said according to our definition um, because all of these entail the other sentence. So C entails B, B entails A, and not the other way around. Um, but the problem is that if I say that's a cat, people usually won't think that I mean, it is not true that that's a cat and I like ice cream. Um, so for some reason, we need a way to explain why these alternatives do not come into play when we say that's a cat. So there are at least two things that could explain why this happens. So either one of these might explain why these alternatives don't come into play, uh, either one or both of them. So first of all, it seems like we don't think about alternatives that would have taken a lot more effort to say. Um, so if I say, that's a cat, maybe people don't ask, why didn't he say that's a cat and 20 other things? Because the answer is kind of already obvious because maybe I didn't want to spend 10 minutes spelling out a million things. So they know why I just said that's the cat. Um, so they, they might not consider alternatives that are much longer and much more detailed than what I said. Um, the other factor that might be, that might matter here is that we don't consider alternatives that are totally irrelevant to the conversation, right? So if, if I say that's a cat, maybe there's no need for people to wonder why I didn't say all those other things because those things are just not relevant. Um, so um, Bart Gertz in one of the, the readings from the bibliography in this class, he talks about this in terms of availability. So he says, if something's relatively easy to say and it's relevant to the conversation, then it's available, available to the conversation or available when we think about implicatures, right? When, when we start to think about what are the other things the person could have said but chose not to say, then we only consider the ones that are available for us to think about, the ones that are relevant and the ones that are not very long and very wordy. Um, this idea of availability can help explain some interesting phenomena that happen with these implicatures. Um, and so one of these phenomena has to do with uh, lexical effects or what kind of words are available in our vocabulary will change what kind of implicatures people get out of what we say. Um, so here's an interesting example from, uh, from Larry Horn from several decades ago. Um, he noted that if I say, I hurt my finger, then usually that implies the finger I hurt was not my thumb, right? So I hurt one of these fingers, but not my thumb. Because if I hurt my thumb, I could have just said, I hurt my thumb. So if I chose to say I hurt my finger, I probably mean I hurt one of these other fingers. But on the other hand, if I say I hurt my toe, people usually won't think that I hurt something other than my big toe. Uh, usually if we say I hurt my toe, it could be any of my 10 toes. It could be one of the little toes or it could be the big toe. Um, so it's possible that the explanation for this is based on the fact that English has a simple word for thumb, but English does not really have one word for big toe. If we wanna say big toe, we have to say big toe. We don't have like a simpler way of saying it. So that might explain why we have this asymmetry of the implicatures, right? Because if I say I hurt my finger, then there's a one word alternative thumb, which is available for us to think about. And so we will easily think, hmm, why didn't he say he hurt his thumb? He must just mean one of the other fingers. 
And that is not the case for big toe, right? We don't have a one word version of big toe. So no one would think, why didn't he say big toe? Um, instead, if someone says, I hurt my toe, that will cover all the toes because there's not a different word for big toe. So that's an example of how availability based on you know, what vocabulary is available and how easy it is for things to say could influence what kinds of implicatures we think of. Um, now, let me give you a more involved example that will also help us see how context might influence things. Um, so it seems like when we have a conversation, there's some sort of implicit or understood agreement about how specific we need to be within that conversation. So let me, uh, let's work through a more specific example to see what I mean by that. Um, let's think of an entailment scale. So think about um, corgis. So a corgi is you know, this kind of dog that's uh, it's kind of very long and fluffy and it has short legs and big ears. A lot of people think they're very cute. Uh, they are very cute. Sometimes they can be very annoying. That's a corgi. It's a specific kind of dog. So corgi entails dog, right? All corgis are dogs. If something is a corgi, then it must be a dog, but not the other way around. Dog does not entail corgi because right? not all dogs are corgis. There are other kinds of dogs too. So that's why I drew this arrow here to represent this entailment relationship. Uh, corgi entails dog, but dog does not entail corgi. And we can make this scale longer because another word that could be on this scale is animal. So dog entails animal, all dogs are animals, but animal does not entail dog. It, it is not the case that all animals are dogs. Some animals are fish, some animals are cats and whatever. So we have this scale from more specific to less specific things we could have said. Um, now imagine, keeping this scale in mind, imagine that someone says, I saw an animal last night. Based on what we know about entailment and alternatives, by now we can explain why these implicatures come up. So if someone says, I saw an animal last night, we might think that she means she doesn't know what kind of animal it was, or at least like she, she's not sure that the animal she saw was a dog because she could have chosen to say, I saw a dog last night because that would have been a more informative and a stronger alternative, but she chose not to say it. So Maybe it's very dark outside. She couldn't see what animal it was. She just saw kind of a shadow or knew there was some kind of animal. So the point here is, if someone says, I saw an animal last night, we might think that she means she's not sure she saw a dog, um, but she just saw some kind of animal. And that implicature arises because dog is a stronger alternative than animal, and she chose not to say it. So, so far, so good. This is this is what we've been seeing over the course of several modules. This is how scalar implicatures work. But let's try to just move over one step on this scale and see if things still work the same. So imagine um, that someone says, I saw a dog last night. So by the logic that we saw before, we could think that if she chose to say, I saw a dog, that means she didn't choose to say, I saw a corgi. And saying, I saw a corgi would have been more informative, but she chose not to say it. So maybe she doesn't know that what she saw was a corgi. But in fact, to me, it feels like that implicature does not happen. Right? So usually if someone says, I saw a dog, I will not always think it means that she doesn't know what kind of dog she saw. Um, particularly if it's something like Corgi or Pug or like one of these kind of dogs that's very recognizable, uh, looks kind of different. If someone saw, if someone says, I saw a dog and she actually saw a Corgi, I, I won't necessarily think she doesn't know it was a Corgi. I will just think she, she didn't need to be so specific. So what this shows us is that it seems like maybe not all of the alternatives matter. Uh, in a conversation. So even though corgi is a stronger alternative than dog, um, it seems like maybe we don't expect people to be that specific in a normal conversation when they're talking about dogs. So if someone says, I saw a dog, we just feel like maybe that's specific enough. And I, I don't 
I don't think she means anything special by choosing not to say corgi. I think maybe she just said dog because that's that's as specific as we needed to be. Um, so it seems like we we get different implicatures here based on how specific along the scale we are. Right? If someone says I saw an animal, it seems to mean she's not sure that she saw a dog. But if she says I saw a dog, it doesn't really mean she's not sure if she saw a corgi. Um, because it seems like saying dog is specific enough for the purposes of everyday conversation. Um, so that seems to be like the default level of how specific we might normally be. But where context comes in and where this gets special is in some other situations, maybe this implicature would happen. Maybe we would expect people to be more specific than just saying dog. Um, so for example, if we are specifically having a conversation about corgis and how many corgis each of us have seen, then if someone says, I saw a dog last night, then it, it really seems like she made a conscious choice not to say corgi. So then it seems to mean something. It, it does seem to mean she chose not to say she saw a corgi. So that must mean that she didn't see a corgi because we're specifically talking about corgis. Um, or if this happens in a different social context. So if, if someone says, I saw a dog and we're at a dog show or a dog park or like some place where there's a lot of dog lovers, then maybe that is a situation where people actually are expected to be more specific. So if, if we're at a, a dog park or a dog lovers, a dog show or something, and I, I just say, I saw a dog, then maybe then it really does imply that I'm not sure what kind, because otherwise, because it's a dog park or a dog lover's place, I, I would be expected to say what kind of dog I saw. Um, so what this example shows us is that which alternatives become available or which alternatives become relevant, like whether or not we think saying corgi is a relevant and specific alternative can really depend on the context that we're in. Um, so the whole, this whole idea of alternatives and how scalar implicatures work, how we figure out what alternatives are, um, it's not completely based on these very formal definitions like we saw in the previous module where we had a definition based on if A entails B and B does not entail A and blah, blah, blah. Um, so maybe those are a necessary condition for an alternative to happen, but the alternatives are also very strongly affected by context, by the real world context, as opposed to the linguistic and semantic background. <clears throat> 